So the next speaker for this morning is John Ellis, who will talk, as you can see, about no-scale inflation, a bridge between string theory and particle physics, question mark. Please, John. Does it work? Not quite. No. No. Microphone here. Okay. Grazie. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. And uh, you've heard some uh, of the more sort of formal ideas underlying uh, models of inflation from the previous speakers. And what I'm going to try to do, as uh, advertised, is try to you know, draw out some possible connections uh, using inflation between what might be at a very primordial scale, uh, namely string theory, with uh, apologies to Abe if he's still here, and uh, actual collider physics, you know, stuff that you can actually observe uh, in experiments in a laboratory. So you already heard from uh, Sergio in particular about cosmological inflation. And so uh, the first couple of slides are probably superfluous, but that'll mean that people can have the time to find their seats. So the idea, as you know, is that uh, there was an early phase of expansion driven by an approximately uh, constant potential, uh, approximately exponential expansion, which enabled pieces of the universe which were originally a long way away from us sorry, originally very close to us, to become a long way away. So all the visible universe was once extremely small. There was the opportunity for clocks to be uh, synchronized. There was a possibility for the universe to become approximately homogeneous. And of course, this exponential expansion gave rise to a, an almost flat geometry. So what, what are we going to be interested in mainly in this talk is cosmological perturbations. So you have this uh, approximate constant potential, uh, presumably due to some sort of effectively uh, uh, elementary scalar field. Fluctuations in this field and in the metric give rise to perturbations, both scalar perturbations and metric or tensor perturbations. And because the expansion is uh, approximately de Sitter, since you've got an approximately constant potential, those potentials are almost independent of the scale size. So I have here a highly sophisticated animation of what's going on. So you start off with quantum fluctuations at the top of the hill, and then when the potential eventually rolls down, those get transferred into fluctuations that you can actually observe in things like the microwave background radiation and large-scale structure. So uh, most models of inflation are formulated in the slow roll approximation, and uh, I'm going to be discussing how one can calculate those parameters in specific inflationary models. So let me introduce these characteristic slow roll parameters. So th we know, of course, that the uh, magnitude of the density perturbations in the very early universe is uh, relatively small. This tells you, actually, that the overall scale of the inflationary potential must be small compared with the Planck scale. Uh, in order to get a sufficiently large number of uh, inflationary expansion E-folds, uh, the potential has to be almost flat. Uh, not only the first derivative must be small, that's what we call epsilon, but also the second derivative, which is called eta, must also be small. And uh, then if you construct your model correctly, then you'll get sufficient number of E-folds of expansion. Typically, you need something like 50 or 60, and we'll come back to that number later on, and how that, together with the values of epsilon and eta, can be used to constrain inflationary models and perhaps also make a link with low-energy physics. So the main observables are precisely the tilt in the scalar spectrum. So this is the deviation from an absolutely flat spectrum and the ratio of the tensor to scalar perturbations. These give you direct measures of these parameters, epsilon and eta. You can also, of course, look for uh, non-Gaussian non effects in the, the spectrum of perturbations. 
Uh, this has been looked for. In particular, this is quantity called FNL that's been the subject of a lot of interest. However, uh, Planck doesn't see any signs of that. Models typically give you very small values of non-Gaussianities, so I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. So, uh, as I said, you, you heard from Sergio earlier on about some models of inflation. I just want to take out uh, one slide to actually uh, summarize the present observational constraints that you get, in particular on the uh, primordial tilt, which is this uh, horizontal scale here. So that's the deviation from a flat spectrum of perturbations. And the vertical axis here, this is the uh, ratio of tensor to scalar perturbations, which is typically small. So the uh, dark blue region here is the region which is favored by the Planck measurements at the 68% confidence level. The paler blue region is allowed at the 95% confidence level. So you can already see that uh, these measurements are severely constraining, not to say giving problems, for many types of inflationary models. So here, for example, is a collection of simple monomial single field models, like, for example, phi squared. Phi squared, the original chaotic model of Linda, uh, was in quite good shape until the Planck data came along, but now it's, it's not looking so good. And uh, people have proposed models based on string theory, where you might have a, even a, an effectively linear potential, perhaps even a, a fractional power potential. But actually, those don't look so good either. There is, however, one model which stands out here. And uh, this is the model proposed by the gentleman sitting in the front row, uh, namely the Starobinsky model, which involves a modification of Einstein gravity to include an R squared term. And so this is the type of model around which much of the current discussion centers. I also mentioned the fact that uh, there is a, a scenario for inflation based on the Higgs field. Sergio mentioned earlier on that now we've actually seen for the first time an apparently elementary scalar field, the Higgs boson. Is it conceivable that the Higgs boson could be responsible for inflation? It actually gives predictions very similar to that of the Starobinsky model. And I'd also like to highlight the fact on this slide that uh, the predictions of these models depend on the number of E-folds, N star. And uh, as you can see from here, you know, the models now, you know, the varying N star from 50 to 60, that's sort of comparable with the one sigma uncertainty in the measurements. So we're getting to the situation where the data is maybe perhaps giving us some hints about the number of E-folds. Okay, so that's the general framework. So what are the challenges for inflationary models? Well, one challenge, I would say, is to make a link with low energy physics. I already mentioned that the only candidate for inflation in the standard model is the Higgs boson. However, there's a problem with that, which I'll discuss in a moment, which is that if you take the measurements at colliders as they are now, and you extrapolate up to high energies, it looks as if the effective potential that you get from the Higgs is negative. If that's the case, obviously you can't do inflation with it. You would also like to link uh, inflation to other areas of physics. So Sergio, for example, has mentioned uh, supersymmetry. Uh, many string theorists like to relate it to some sort of axion-type particle. And of course, you would like to relate it to Planck scale physics. And uh, there's a whole industry of people looking at inflaton candidates in string theory. Uh, since string is presumably compactified down to four dimensions at a distance scale which is very small compared with the typical inflationary Hubble scale, it seems to me appropriate that one should look for inflaton candidates not in the full string theory necessarily, but in the effective field theory you get from compactified string. Okay, so now let's zero in on inflationary models in the light of Planck. So we have this relatively restricted allowed range for the magnitude, sorry, for the tilt and the scalar, spe uh, scalar spectrum of perturbations is about uh, 0 0.96, 0 0.97. We've got an upper limit uh, on the ratio of the tensor to scalar perturbations, which is about 0 0.1. And this is just reproducing the picture that I showed a short while ago. 
And as I already emphasized, these measurements are a challenge for many simple inflationary models. Maybe Stavrovinsky is the answer, or possibly Higgs inflation, or as I will argue, supersymmetry and supergravity. So let me uh, remind you a little bit of uh, the Starobinsky model. So uh, as you know, what you do is you uh, add an R squared term to the Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian. And if you look at it naively, you would say, well, there's no scalar field there. So how do you do inflation? Well, wait a bit, wait a bit. So the first calculations, as far as I'm aware, of uh, perturbations in this model were done by Mukhanov and Chibisov shortly after the original proposal by Starobinsky. And it was only later that people actually realized that you could reformulate the theory in terms of a canonical uh, Einstein-Hilbert-Lagrangian and an additional scalar field, what has been called the scalar one. So in fact, there is a scalar field in this theory. Okay, now, well, perhaps I should just flip back a little bit and I just ask you to look at this effective potential that you get in the uh, Starobinsky model here in the bottom right-hand corner. It's a, a constant approached exponentially. So, what about Higgs inflation? So, uh, here I've written the uh, standard Higgs potential, uh, Higgs kinetic term. Oops. Okay, back again. Okay, so I've got uh, a standard Higgs potential, I've got a Higgs kinetic term, and there is a non-minimal coupling of the Higgs field to the curvature term, to, the, to, to R. So you can consider this in the limit where this parameter psi here, this non-minimal coupling is very large, and you can transform to the Einstein frame and you get canonical Higgs, canonical Einstein-Hilbert Lagrangian, and an effective potential. And lo and behold, that effective potential is almost identical to the Starobinsky potential. It certainly has the form of a constant that's expo approached exponentially. So that this looks like it would be a very successful model for inflation. However, there is a problem, which I already alluded to, namely that if you take the low energy measurements and you extrapolate up to high energies, it looks like this effective potential is in fact negative, not positive, as you would require for inflation. So the Higgs potential, like anything else, gets renormalized by quantum effects, it renormalizes itself, but it turns out that in the standard model, the dominant renormalization is actually negative and is driven by the large mass of the top quark, which together with the mass of the Higgs boson, has been measured at the LHC and other colliders. And as you can see in this most recent calculation by de Grassi et al., that effective Higgs potential parameter goes negative. It goes negative at a scale of around 10 to the 11 GV, so below the scale at which you would like to do inflation. So on the face of it, it looks like you don't have a potential suitable for inflation. Of course, there are people who are still... no trying variations of this model. I'll perhaps mention one myself a little bit later on. Uh, but on the face of it, it looks like not good news. I might mention that this problem, like so many other problems, is avoided by supersymmetry. Supersymmetry avoids this instability in the effective potential. Okay, so supersymmetry. So, so for inflation, you want something which looks at least effectively like some sort of quasi-elementary scalar field. And as we well know, supersymmetry is the sort of symmetry that you need in order to stabilize the properties of such an elementary scalar field. Specifically, if you want to get the right magnitude of perturbations, remember they're at the level of one part in 10 to the fifth, you need a, an inflaton mass or some other parameter in your potential, which is very much smaller than unity, if you're talking about a quartic coupling, very much less than the Planck mass if you're talking about the mass of the inflaton. And what better than supersymmetry than to stabilize those small values of either the mass parameter or the self-coupling parameter. Now, once you've bought supersymmetry, 
then I'm sorry, but in cosmology, you're necessarily going to have to also buy supergravity. Uh, well, you kind of expected that anyway, because the only good symmetry is a local one, and the local version of supersymmetry is, of course, supergravity. But anyway, since we're talking about the early universe, where we're necessarily involving gravity as well as supersymmetry, so I may think we're, we're pretty much stuck with a supergravity theory. So then the question is, which supergravity theory? So uh, you heard from Sergio, you also uh, heard from Chris in the talks earlier on this morning, that there are many different variations of supergravity theory. Now, if you take the simplest possible supergravity theory uh, and you just couple in matter, you encounter a problem that the effective potential has holes in it. It's not a potential which is positive semi-definite, which is what you would want for cosmology, what you would want for inflation. It actually has holes in the effective potential which are of order minus one in natural units. But there is an exception to this. And this is the exception known as no-scale supergravity, which has been mentioned earlier on. Uh, no-scale supergravity, a particular version of supergravity that was focused on by Eugène Kremer, Sergio, and collaborators back in 1983. Now, the interesting thing for me is that this theory also appears naturally in compactifications of string theory, as was pointed out first by Witten in 1985 and has been developed by many subsequent authors. So this, I think, is a natural framework for considering inflation, and uh, this is what, with my collaborators, Dimitri Nanopoulos and Keith Olive, we've been doing over the last couple of years. I, I might mention that no-scale supergravity had, of course, been considered for inflation previously. Uh, I think, actually, the first people to discuss it were Goncharov and, uh, and Linda. Uh, so this is not exactly a novelty. Okay, so I, I, I try to restrict to the minimum uh, the technicalities of this, but uh, I can't resist showing you a, a, a few formally. In particular, uh, you heard from previous speakers that supergravity theory is calculated by a Kähler potential. That Kähler potential takes a particularly simple, not, minim not minimal, but rather simple form in uh, no-scale supergravity. And you will also notice that it has a sort of non-compact coset structure, which is rather reminiscent of what Chris Howell was talking about just before the break. So what we did a couple of years ago was we said, okay, let us uh, add to this the minimum possible interacting matter field theory, which is actually what was written down by uh, Julius West and Bruno Zamino, the first supersymmetric model in four dimensions back in 1983. And uh, you calculate the effective potential, and to our surprise, we found that this West Semino model gives you decent inflation. Uh, and here's a picture of the uh, inflationary potential that you get for various different uh, values of the parameters. And uh, if you look at this, you see this black one there, which is sort of approaching a constant at large field values, and seems to be approaching it uh, relatively uh, quickly. And I, I remember when Keith Olive uh, talked to me on Skype and he said, you know, it looks kind of like Starobinsky. Actually, he said, it actually is Starobinsky. So you take the minimal supergravity, uh, no-scale supergravity model, you add in the minimal interaction of matter, and you get a Starobinsky model of inflation. So this is just to uh, drive this point home. Here I remind you of what the uh, Starobinsky model looks like. I remind you of the effective potential where you approach a constant uh, exponentially fast. And for the West Amino model with a particular, I admit, fine-tuned choice of parameters, then you get exactly the same potential. So uh, we were you know, extremely uh, surprised, impressed, and gratified to discuss that. Uh, we were perhaps a tad disappointed to learn that actually Chicotti, in a paper back in 1987, had also noticed that there was a connection between no-scale supergravity and uh, the Starobinsky model, although back in 1987 he hadn't a thought of the application 
to inflation. So that's the simplest possible no-scale inflationary model. You can consider variations uh, on a theme where the exponential approach to a constant uh, has uh, different parameter values. And uh, interestingly, you can relate the possible values of those parameters to various different ways of compactifying string theory. Uh, so for example, uh, measuring the value of the tensor to scalar ratio R within this framework could be uh, a way of probing the way in which string is compactified. So uh, I've talked a little bit, uh, perhaps too much, about our own particular work on no-scale supergravity inflation. There's actually been a whole flood of papers since uh, we wrote that first paper back in uh, May uh, 2013. Here I just list uh, some of the earlier papers uh, by now, there's somewhat uh, over 100 papers on this particular approach to constructing inflationary models. And uh, if you're interested, just uh, earlier on this week, uh, we put on the archive uh, a review of this approach if you want to learn some more. So w within this framework, it's natural to get uh, Starobinsky-like inflation, but you can also, uh, without too much effort, also get uh, the old... Uh, Linda chaotic inflationary model. So uh, here's a simple two-field reduction of this model. Here you get Starobinsky. Over here you get the chaotic uh, quadratic potential. And you can see this explicitly in this picture here. In uh, one direction you get a quadratic potential. In the other you get the Starobinsky potential. You can even rescue Higgs inflation. Uh, I mentioned that Higgs inflation has the problem that you get a negative potential if you extrapolate up to high energies in the standard model. But if you embed it in no-scale supergravity, and I won't go through the technical tricks, but you can naturally get, again, a model that interpolates between the Starobinsky model and this chaotic uh, phi-squared inflation. So I just wanted to say a few words about uh, the number of E-folds. So the number of e-folds, as we saw, is something that begins to be constrained by the, by the observational data. And we recently wrote a paper where we calculated in some detail uh, how the number of e-folds depends on the parameters of your inflationary model, uh, in particular the amplitude of perturbations uh, and the way in which the inflaton decays. So the way the inflaton decays, obviously, is very important for the connection with low energy phenomenology. So uh, here I've got on the uh, horizontal axis, for example, the inflaton decay coupling. On the vertical axis, I've got the uh, number of E-folds. Planck gives you a lower limit at the 68% confidence level on the number of E-folds. This is what they allow at the 95% confidence level. But you see that uh, this constraint is already beginning to constrain your models of inflaton decay, and hence, by implication, the connection of inflationary cosmology with low energy, perhaps collider physics that you can actually observe. So this is just some formulae that uh, underlie that. I won't go through them in detail, but I just want to show you that uh, within Starobinsky-like models, you get a, a relatively uh, small allowed range of uh, the parameters. And if you construct models reasonable models of inflaton decay, you would actually predict that you're right close to this 68% confidence level lower bound on uh, N star coming from the Planck data. So in the near future, maybe uh, one might be able to get information about the, inflaton, the way the inflaton decays as well as the effective inflaton potential. So finally, w w what about the connection with collider physics? So uh, we did an exercise within this particular framework of uh, implementing, implementing all the possible constraints you could think of, like uh, the LHC, like the mass of the Higgs boson. There was an earlier question about supersymmetric dark matter, Starobinsky-like inflation, leptogenesis, uh, neutrino masses, you know, everything. And uh, this is what you get. You actually get a, a relatively restricted range of parameters. Uh, so again, in answer to the question uh, before the break, 
this uh, blue line here, that's where you get good supersymmetric dark matter. And perhaps I should explain, the horizontal axis here is something related to the mass of the gluino, a particle that you could hope to discover at the LHC. Uh, well, you can hope to discover it, but you haven't discovered it yet. And uh, in fact, the uh, current lower limit on the gluino mass is about uh, 1.2 TeV. You read it off from here. And uh, this is the future reach of the LHC, which goes up to something like 3 TeV. So uh, there's a big range of supersymmetric masses that can be explored in the relatively near future with collider experiments. And uh, these should be able to cover at least a significant fraction of the parameter range allowed in that model of no scale supersymmetric inflation. So those are the prospects for the LHC. What's the LHC actually doing at the moment? Well, uh, I checked earlier on this morning and it's making collisions. Uh, it's uh, making collisions at uh, 13 TV in the center of mass. So that's uh, almost a factor of two larger than the energies before the break uh, when it discovered the Higgs boson. So that large increase in the energy will give you a large reach in looking for supersymmetric particles. So who knows? Maybe it will discover supersymmetry in the next few years. Okay, so that brings me to the uh, end of my talk. I've tried to uh, summarize very briefly uh, how inflation can solve many of the biggest problems in cosmology. I talked about uh, flatness. I talked about homogeneity. Uh, now, with the you know, tremendous new sets of data coming from Planck and other experiments, uh, models of inflation are being constrained. It's you know, a good time to be constructing models of inflation. So as I argued, I think that in order to stabilize the effective inflaton potential, you would like to uh, embed it in a supersymmetric framework. Cosmology requires supergravity. The natural framework, I would argue, is no scale supergravity, uh, which I remind you is motivated by compactification from string theory. CMB data are now at the stage where they're starting to constrain these models. Uh, the uh, slow roll parameters, also the number of E-folds during inflation, which is related to the way in which the inflaton decays. So let's see who discovers supersymmetry first. Thank you. Okay, so this contribution is open to discussion. Let's see. Are there questions or My comments? My question uh, is ah. connected with okay. um, cosmology see. requires supergravity. Supergravity, it's theory, classical theory, which corresponds to supergravity. It is Poincaré's theory of gravity in the space-time with uh, curvature and torsion. And effect of torsion plays an important role because uh, in the frame of this theory, limiting uh, um, energy density appears, uh, vacuum uh, repulsion effect, uh, and uh, what torsion effects consider you in your consideration? Thank you for that uh, question. In fact, it's possible that torsion plays a key role in actually generating supersymmetry breaking. And this is uh, something that uh, Nick Mavronotos and I wrote a paper about uh, two or three years ago. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion earlier on about supersymmetry breaking. Uh, I think that the supersymmetry breaking scale is typically smaller than the Hubble scale during inflation. And uh, so for that reason, I'm not so keen on little models with nil potent fields as was discussed by uh, Sergio Ferrara. Uh, I think it would be very interesting to pursue further this idea of dynamical supersymmetry breaking, uh, making use of the torsion. Uh, uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is a uh, too naive question. First one is uh, why do you call it a uh, no scale inflation? Uh, the second question is uh, it seems uh, 
uh, your effective action has uh, two scalar fields, uh, and one is star, star Robinsky potential, the other is M square and phi square. Have you checked uh, the possible ISO curvature perturbations? So, so thank you for those two questions. So uh, we originally called it no scale because the potential, if, if you just take that minimal Kähler potential, and you calculate the effective scalar potential, it is zero. It is absolutely flat. So it has no scale in the horizontal direction and it has no scale in the vertical direction. So we called it no scale. Okay. Uh, so with regard to the second question, it, indeed, uh, I think that the minimal model that you need actually has two complex fields. So there's the T field, which you can regard as uh, some modulus of compactification, and some matter field, which we called phi. Uh, maybe it's a supersymmetric neutrino or something. So indeed, you have to consider multi-field effects. And uh, this is something that uh, we did in the paper. I could give you uh, more detailed references. Uh, so one possible solution is to postulate that uh, there are some additional terms in the Kähler potential that basically squeeze the field down so that it becomes essentially a one-field problem. Or you can just allow it to wander all over the multi-field parameter space. And as we showed in the large region of that parameter space, you still get very good inflation. Is there any hint to a physical principle which would force upon us the inflation hypothesis? <laughs> Force, I don't know. I mean, uh, I guess that people like Stephen Hawking have argued that something very similar to inflation comes from his uh, approach to quantum gravity. Uh, for me, it's, I just think it's a very attractive hypothesis that addresses you know, all these many different cosmological problems that I've highlighted on, the, on this slide. Uh, but uh, force, no, I wouldn't go so far as to say force. You, you discussed uh, the relationship between inflation and particle physics, but um, there is also a question between the relationship between inflation and general relativity, because a uh, long time ago, and actually it was announced in one of the Marcel Grossman meetings uh, first for the first time, we noticed that in order to start inflation, you need that the the scalar field should be homogeneous on a scale that is larger than the local horizon at that time by some significant amount. So in, in, from this point of view, the whole inflationary problem, issue is unnatural because you don't expect um, a, a, a scalar field to be homogeneous on scales larger than the local horizon at any given time unless you have some physical motivation from that. Now this was based on numerical correlation, fairly simple numerical calculation but fully general relativistic which was done about 25 years ago. I wonder if there was any progress on this field that resolved this issue. So I, I certainly agree that this is an issue so uh, maybe I should have put here may help solve, okay. <laughs> uh, so there is the initial question of the initial conditions for inflation. And I think this is, you know, for example, one of the issues that uh, Ape Ashtakar was addressing in his uh, talk earlier on. And I think a, a lot of people are, given the apparent success now of the uh, inflationary paradigm, shifting their attention to this uh, pre-inflationary uh, issue that you're raising. I wouldn't say that there is a, a consensus on the solution. Uh, one, one final question. Hello? Uh, I was. Okay, then two oh, final questions. I was <laughs> only. I d d don't actually want to, 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 to make a question. I want only to add to, to your answer uh, to, to the previous question. My uh, feeling is 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 this kind of models in which you are speaking, in which the potential is approximately flat, and this more or less um, uh, 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 can be modeled by a cosmological 
uh, constant. In case of an exact uh, cosmological uh, constant, it was proved also uh, many years ago that at Vera exists a, a generic a generic a solution which, uh, which approaches uh, uh, the decider like asymptotic behavior in an in the nature of initial conditions uh, that having a non-zero uh, uh, that having a non-zero inertia. So if we have a solution of the field equation uh, which is a, a generic attractor, we we need not have uh, uh, we need not make any reference about causal about causal connection. Can I One have, last question over a, there. Yep. I have a very small question. Uh, can you distinguish between your model and the, and the Starobisky? Can you distinguish between your model and the Starobisky model at the level of reheating? Is there any possibility that, that for instance, that the reheating temperature will be different? You will see any difference uh, at, at, at that level or, or not? So, uh, as we discussed in our, in our paper, the, the amount of reheating can be calculated you know, very precisely in any given model. Okay. Now, the original Snarobinsky model, of course, didn't consider how the inflaton would decay. Right? So you would have to add something into the Snarobinsky scenario in order to do that. Uh, but whatever you do, it's going to be quite tightly constrained by the data. Okay, so uh, I think we can now thank John for his presentation.